up, everybody? I'm blessed and free. Welcome back to another episode of DOC TV. So if you guys are tuning in for the first time, haven't watched any videos on this channel, we like to cover jail, prison, corruption, and everything in between. I like to bring guests on this channel, especially guests that have a crazy story, so you guys can hear a perspective of how it is for everybody that grew up and ended up in the prison system and then got out and did something with their life. So, man, why don't you uh, tell the people watching at home uh, what's your name and where you're from? Uh, my name is Gene Borello, and I am from Howard Beach, Queens. I was a henchman for the mafia. Damn, so you were really uh, putting in some work, huh? Right. What was life like for you growing up? Like, how did you get to that point? Like I says, uh, I, I had uh, talked on a lot of shows before, and I always said, you know, the environment that we grew up in, it was all around us. Uh, we didn't look up to athletes. We looked up to gangsters. Um, we were born in a mafia, so neighbor, neighborhood to the core. We had four bosses living over here, tons and tons and dozens and dozens of members and associates, and it was just all around us. It was just our normal. And uh, it's like this. It's either you're going to become a working man in this area, or you're going to become a gangster. That's really the two options in that neighborhood. Yeah. So you're kind of like a product of your environment, basically. Right. It was, you know, my uncle was a boss. My grandfather died in jail. My cousin was killed in a mob hit. I mean, you know, it was just all around me my whole life. So when did you actually like start putting in work for the mafia? Um, I mean, I started my crime life at 16. I started putting work in for the mob about 19 years old. And it started off, you know, small things, assaults, collections, things. And, you know, it worked its way up by the time I was 21. I was trying to kill people for them and shoot people and stuff like that. So are you allowed to say, like, what family you were really, like, working with? Yes. Okay. I, worked with the I worked with the Bonanno crime family. I served under uh, Bonanno Capo Vinny Asaro and Bonanno Capo Ronald Gialonzo. These are two powerhouse names from the family. All right. And what are some like other like, you know, I've read a bunch of mafia books I, ever since I was a kid. I was always into that. You know, once you watch Goodfellas, you're like, right. man, this shit's gangster. So like what what like popular mob figures other than the ones you just named, like, did you come in contact with? Well, someone played as my uncle in Goodfellas. My uncle was Fat Andy Ruggiano. Um, he was a powerful captain through all of Ozone Park. He ran the whole area. Um, he came up on the album Anastasia. He was part of Murder Inc. Um, he was a vicious, notorious murderer, and that's my blood. That's my relative. So um, I had come in contact with him since I'm a kid, and um, he died when I was young, so I never got to work for him. But his son was a good a mentor to me, also Anthony Ruggiano. Uh, he was also a mob guy, and um, he served tw over uh, almost 20 years in prison for murders and everything else. And um, another guy that we looked up to. I know you were putting in work and everything. What was the craziest thing that you think you did like in your life of crime? I mean, shooting people in broad daylight is pretty crazy. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> yeah. Doing, do, doing arm robbery stickups, uh, jewelry store arm robberies, um, you know, uh, digging holes. I mean, you know, just crazy stuff. You know what I mean? It was just a lot of, a lot of chaos in my life. You're doing crime. Obviously you're doing it for the respect and the money and, and, you know, you're, you're already in it and everything. Like, what was the most money, like, you came across during your time, you know, with the mafia? I mean, at my high point, like I said, I know I never bullshit. I always keep it real. Um, I was making about five to 10000 a week. And, you know, plus scores. I was doing a lot of scores. So I was pulling about 30000 maybe to 40000 sometimes a month. And that, and that was for a little while. And then plus I had a lot of scores I was doing. So I was constantly doing arm robbery. So I was always had a constant money flow. And I lived like, a, you know, it would never end. What was the craziest armed robbery that you did that you can talk about? Uh, I got to say the, the most wildest one was we hit a jewelry store in broad daylight and we tied them up in the store in broad daylight and took the whole store in broad daylight on a summer day. So, yeah, yeah I would say that's definitely <laughs> the most wildest one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy, bro. Yeah. What when did you first like get a rep? Like what was a big arrest that, that you went through that, you know, caused you to either go to jail or prison? My first arrest was a kilo of cocaine at 18 years old. Um, that was serious. I got locked up with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather took most of the weight. I ended up serving only two years. And then I came home. I caught a shooting case. I went back again. And then I came home and then I caught um, just conspiracy to everything and all over. All right. So where did they uh, send you when they locked you up? Um, Rikers Island. All right. So, I mean, how was Rikers Island for, you know, a mafia guy? 
Well, here's the thing with Rikers Island. There's no mob, guys. So in Rikers Island, you know, you got to show yourself. You got to be who you really are. You know, it's not like you go into the feds, and when you go in the feds, it's all your people. You know, if I go into the feds, I got all my Italian people. When I go into Rikers Island, it's all gang members. It's all Bloods, Crips, Latin Kings, and they don't care about who you are. You know, I mean, yeah, they like Italian people, but at the end of the day, you're by yourself. So you got to really show who you are and what you're capable of because they will try you. Rikers Island is the most violent county in America. I see more cuttings and stabbings than you'll see in a lifetime. It, it, it's just amazing how many I've seen in there and the assaults and the fights I've been to and everything in that place. It's just so crazy. Yeah, I've actually like watched a couple documentaries on it. And I was in prison with a guy that did time in Rikers. And when I, we were in prison in Florida, like, you know, prison in Florida sucks, but he was like, man, you guys have no idea what our county jail is like. So I was like, damn. So yeah. when you were in there, man, like, did they, did you get tried? Like, like how did your oh, time go and what happened with that? Oh, well, you know, I got my teeth chipped. I got jumped. You know, I fought. I mean, you know, I was in raise, uh, knife fights, razor fights. I mean, you name it. Um, I mean, you, you had to see the things. You had to fight to sit down. You know, you couldn't sit on a chair unless you fought for your chair. You couldn't yeah. eat your frosted flakes in the morning unless you were somebody. You know, it was just a whole nightmare in there, you know? Yeah. Did you um, end up riding like with any gangs or were you no. just? This is why they ended up loving me so much because I was just by myself and they used to ask me to join their gangs and I would laugh at them and go, come on, man, I'm Italian. I can't be in no bloods or crips. I says, you know, I'm, I, I says, I'll go home. I'll get shot in the head for doing that. I says, uh, I'm by myself, man. You know, uh, I, I, if anyone wants anything, they want to fight, I'll fight anybody. Anyone wants to do anything, I'll do it. But I don't ride with no gangs. You know, I was friends with them, but I never rode with them. Yeah, I hear you, man. So like, you know, when you start doing for me, when I started doing time, like that really affects like your family, your friends and everything else. I mean, it sounds like a lot of your family and friends were, you know, kind of with you, like with the mafia type stuff, you know, how did that affect you, man? Like when you were going through all that, like, was your family there for you or like what, how did that go for you? Yeah. My family was there big time. Um, my friends were there for me at first, you know, big time. And, um, like I said, it's, it affects everything because, you know, when you go in there, you have to depend on people on the outside. If you have nobody on the outside, then you're screwed. You know, you got your commissary, your packages, everything's dependent on people from the outside. So if you don't have anybody looking out for you, it's really, really hard. And I've seen people, you know, live like that. And, you know, it makes, it puts them in such a bad place and it creates more violence, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's why so many people are stealing and robbing because they don't have anybody. I saw right. a lot of that, you know, when I was in. All right, man. So you go through Rikers Island, you get out. Um, and so what happened when you got out? Like, how did things go for you then? Well, I mean, I just fell right back into place. You know, um, I started doing collections. I was doing sports. I was doing loan shocking. And, you know, I just got right back to my position and um, just started going back to work, you know? Like, what did that work entail when you do the same thing, the robberies? Robbery was my side gig. You know, I was an armed robber. But my main thing was loan sharking and sports betting. That was what we did for the mob. That was our bread and butter. So we would have a big racket of sports betting and loans. The guy I worked for was worth almost $30 million. He made almost fifty to 100000 a week. Um, this guy had a major, major money operation. And I basically controlled it for him. And if anyone didn't pay, I would handle it. Yeah, so I see a lot of that, too, in the movies. Like, how does a guy live that's making $30 million, like, like what, what did you see? Like the cars, like what kind of houses are, do they live like low key? So they well, don't bring heat. No, my guy <laughs> did any, my guy did not live low key. He lived in a $3 million mansion on the corner. Uh, it had six bedrooms. He had Mercedes, his BMWs, you know, the guy lived like, you know, like a King. Um, I mean, he couldn't show for anything. So they ended up taking it, but um, his, his money was just crazy. And his house was insane. Yeah. So what do you think out of all your time doing what you were doing, man, like was the craziest mobster that, that you knew? There's a few. I mean, uh, Ronnie one Arm was really treacherous. Charles Caniglia was really treacherous. Um, Vinny Asaro, the guy I worked for, these guys were real ruthless killers. I mean, um, you had guys like Peter Saccaro, you had guys like Johnny Eli, you had guys like so many treacherous guys in my era that, you know, they were kind of gone when I was, in the life in jail, but they were they were known to to be do still doing things in the early two thousands. I mean, um, 
there was a bunch, you know, in the Bronx, you had Johnny Joe Spirito, you had Frankie Lino, these guys were, were murderers, Vito Guzzo, these guys killed my cousin, these guys were, were animal murderers, you know, they didn't care, vicious dudes. Um, has someone ever tried to kill you? Yeah, three times. And what happened with that, man? Uh, one time they tried to kill me on the highway, they missed me and shot my friend through the neck. Um, one time they tried to kill me in my house with a machine gun, they shot my house up with a Mac-10 machine gun. One time they tried to shoot me in front of my house going in. You know, I had a bunch of uh, attempts on me. Damn, bro, that's crazy. Yeah. So when you got back out and you're, you're, you know, you fell back into the life, how long was it before you actually like caught another case where you're like, all right, man, I might be going to prison on this one? Well, when I got out on my second case, um, I had about a 50 month run and the whole time they were investigating me, I didn't even know. So they were just building, you know, a case on me. So I ended up getting hit with three different conspiracies of everything under the sun. And that's what happened. And so how did that go down when they actually came, came and got you? Well, they locked me up going to a wedding. Oh, how nice of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then what, they, you, you went back to Rikers or were you a federal? No. Point? Yeah, I was in state and federal. I did both. Okay. So did you, so you went to state prison in New York then, right? Yeah. All right. And what prison did you land at when you did I that? I was in Groveland Correctional Facility. I was in Green. Green was extremely wild, really, really violent, dangerous jail. One of the most uh, violent mediums in the whole state. Um, same thing, same violence, you know, chaos, basically. So did they let, what'd you do, your state time, and then the feds got you after that and brought you? No, no, the state, the third bit, I never made it to the state jail. I ended up going to the feds. So I never got to make it to state. I sat in Rikers for about 19 months, and I got pulled out to the feds. But in my second bit, I was in Green, Groveland, a few spots. And what would you say? Cause you know, I always get asked questions about like, what is the difference in state and federal when you're doing time? What did, what did you notice? Like, what are the big differences that you experienced? The big, the big difference is this, the state is, is more violent. Um, federal, you have to understand some, well now feds are taking anybody, but back in the day, feds only took like certain crimes. Now the feds are taking more of gang members where the state, that's all they dealt with was gang members and, you know, just any kind of crime. Feds were, had more high profile crimes where there wasn't that much violence inside. Now, I believe the feds is getting worse because they're making gang members RICO. So now they're getting all the gang members inside the feds. The state was just wild because it's all gang members stabbing each other and just have nothing to look forward to and no money. Where the feds, there's a lot of money guys, you know, they had a lot of money generating. And it was more high profile crimes and people where it was more organized. The state was more chaotic. So have you ever been in jail or prison in any other states other than New York? Uh, I was locked up in Florida, but I only got held for like two days and then I got back out and I got out. I did have a Florida conspiracy. Where, where did you get locked up in Florida? Boca Raton. <laughs> oh, that's a rich area in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Jewelry <laughs> store robbery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. funny. So, all right, man. Well, how long did you do total when you did your time on those cases? Uh, 10 years, six months. Damn, bro. That's a minute. Yeah. yeah. So when you, when you were in there, man, and you were getting close to getting out, like, what was your plan then? I mean, the first two bids was always just go back to the street and just do what I know. This one was different. I knew I had to change up and do the right thing and just try not to think about going back and really doing time for people that didn't care about you. Because at the end of the day, the mob, they're all users. You know, you learn that when you go in jail and you're facing all this time and people turn on you and people stop looking out for you and, you know, everything you've done for people, they just spit on you while you're down, kick you while you're down. Um, you start to realize, like, I got to do something different now. This shit is not worth it. Why do I want to die in jail? Why do I want to do this for, for people that don't give a fuck about me? So you really got to sit back and evaluate and start doing best for what's best for you. Yeah. So at that point, you just totally walked away from the life. Yeah, I walked away, man. I started a whole new thing. I have a podcast now. I try to help kids stay out of jail. I try to keep people away from this bullshit, fake persona life. You know, I lived and I died for these people. I would do anything for them. You know, it was just the order away for me doing it. All you had to do is tell me to do it. And I did it. And they took advantage of it. Did you have any trouble, man, when you got out and walked away from the life as far as like them wanting you to be back? No, no, they basically, no. I mean, like I said, like I'm not knocking the mafia, which I do sometimes, but it's kind of washed up. You know, a lot of guys, it's just not the same anymore. The modern day guys are really about the gun game no more. They're more about just sports loans and maybe a little fighting. 
when I was coming up, guys were still getting shot and killed and chaos. You know what I mean? So it was a little different. Nowadays, nobody's getting shot and killed no more or anything of that nature. For people that go to prison, man, I'm sure you know that with the recidivism rate and everything, it's kind of hard to break that cycle for a lot of people. And that's why you go on what they call like the life installment plan where you just that's keep right. going back. How, right. What would you tell somebody that, you know, is getting out of prison and they really think there's no hope and, and they just, you know, go back to crime? How does someone change that up? Well, like I said, you always you always have a choice. You know, I always said, oh, I had no choice. That was bullshit. I, so, I told that to myself. You always have a choice. If you really don't want to go back, here's the thing. And, and I'll break this down to you and you know from being in prison. How much do they pay you when you work in jail? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Let me hear it. How much? Ten cents I didn't make nothing when I was in jail. Okay, so right is out in the state, they'll pay you seven to 10 cents an hour. So you won't go work McDonald's for $15 an hour if you really don't want to go back to jail, but you're willing to go to jail and make 10 cents an hour, but you'll work for them. Think about that. Yeah, I've seen that happen too. Like guys don't work on the street. They come to jail and they're like, right when they get in, they fill out the request, man, I want to be a trustee. I want to go work. Right. And they don't, they're not making shit. And I'm like, right. Well, you didn't have, you weren't living like that on the street, bro. <laughs> right. So if you really don't want to go back, you always have a choice. You know what I mean? I, some kids, they say, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, sometimes those poverty areas, it's very hard for them. But like I said, if you really don't want to live the crime life and you really don't want to worry about someone killing you every day or being in shootouts or worrying about the cops coming for you, kicking your door in, you have a choice, you know, you, you can make the change and you can do the right thing. Did you ever have any issues like getting out? Like, did you go straight to the podcast or did you try to like work a normal job? Like, how did all that go down? Well, my rap sheet is atrocious. I mean, beyond <laughs> atrocious. I mean, it's just like nothing but shootings and attempt murders and armed robberies and all. It's just insane. Like if you, it, it would be so hard to, for me to get a job with my record. It's just so bad. But um, I knew that I had a voice that, that wanted to be heard. And I knew what I could do with it because I know people will listen to me because I really came from these streets. I really did this stuff. I work for mob bosses. I come from a mafia family. So I knew people would really listen to me and my work. Like when you do the podcast, man, like, I mean, explain to the people watching, like what you're doing with that. And, you know, I'll put a link in the description so that way anyone who's watching this can go ahead and go subscribe to your channel. But just uh, give them like a little, you know, a brief synopsis of what you do on there. So we bring in form, former street guys, former mafia gang members. It don't matter. We work with everybody. We try to keep people out of it and explain what the life is and what it does. It does nothing. There's only two end results, and I'm sure you can answer that. What's the two end results? Yeah, jail and death. That's it. That's it. That's your end results. I don't care what organization you're a part of. Okay, it's going to happen one way or another. You can't be out in the street doing what you want and think the law enforcement ain't going to be on you. I learned that the hard way when I had my own task force on me. Okay, it's just the way it goes. You know, um, if you want to sit there and you want to be the big, bad, tough guy, when you go to jail and your wife is fucking someone else, you, you know, <laughs> your, your friends are gone, you have no money coming in, you took that 10, 20 piece for them and they don't give a fuck about you. Then you'll listen to Gene and say, wow, he was right. Because I've been hearing it a lot lately. Especially now, man, they're handing out time like, like it's nothing. Listen, when you get with the feds, they have laws that you have no idea. Rico, when this Rico is in front of something, it's just a whole different ballgame. You'll have guidelines that'll make your eyes fall out of your head. Okay, let me. If you shoot somebody in the leg for the mafia, you could get 20 years for that. If you shoot, so if you shoot somebody for yourself and not the mafia, you get five years. Okay, so it's Crazy. like it, it, when you have anything with RICO and conspiracy and these federal organizations, that's it. They're not playing games. They're gonna put you out. They'll give you life in prison for conspiracy to commit murder with no commit, just talking about it, and blow trial to it, and they'll give you life. So you have to understand how dangerous they are. When they want you, they want you. So you have to really explain to these kids, this game, this is not a game. When you start playing with those guns and you want to hurt people and work for these people, just know what comes with it. You might make the money. You might drive the car like I did. I had brand new BMWs, Mercedes. I had all the hot women. But I also had a 30-piece over my head. I also had, you know, violence people trying to kill me and a lot of great chaos that comes with that money and glamour. What's your opinion as far as like corruption within the FBI, the criminal justice system? Well, the FBI, I never seen corruption because they are very, very strict. They are. The state, when you're in Rikers Island in the state, they're very corrupt, super corrupt. In Rikers Island, the CEOs are gang members, some of them. So they're bringing in the drugs. I mean, if you want to see chaos, they're selling razor blades to the inmates to cut each other. So think about that. You're getting the weapons from the cops. How does that make any sense? They're charging you a hundred dollars for, for a surgical scalpel, a surgical scalpel they're selling. So people are getting <laughs> cut 
people are getting cut with surgical scalpels in Rikers Island. Yeah, that's so nice of them. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I just want to thank you for coming on the channel, bro. You got a good story. And, you know, I really like bringing people on this channel that have lived that life like, you know, me and you have and want to give back and, and, and help people that are still stuck in that life. So uh, big props to you, man, for doing what you do. If you haven't, go ahead and subscribe to his channel. I've checked it out, man. You got a lot of a lot of episodes and a lot of people are watching. So, yeah, man, I appreciate you for coming on the channel, bro. Absolutely. And um, anyone could reach out to me on my Instagram on Gene Barrello. Um, check out my show, The Johnny and Gene Show. And um, like I said, I answer everybody and I'm always here to help. All right. All right, man. I appreciate it. So if you haven't, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Then go subscribe to his channel, uh, like the video and drop a comment. And with that is DOC TV and we're out.